Well, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate everyone taking the time out of their busy schedules to spend a few minutes here with us this afternoon. Um, I don't know where you're all sitting, but it's, uh, it's cold and snowy here outside of Philadelphia. Um, while my true superstar team down in Florida get to enjoy the nice weather, we're a little chilly here with some snow, but that's all good. Um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Mike Holloway. I am the CEO of Futures Recovery and Healthcare. And uh, I'm blessed to say that my family owns Futures and we started the company back in 2012. So believe it or not, it's hard to believe that we're, we're uh, operational for almost a decade now, coming on into our ninth year of, of operations. Um, for those of you who haven't uh, heard of Futures Recovery Healthcare, um, you know, our goal is really to, just to focus on the highest quality of patient care. And I'm so excited today to be able to announce to each and every one of you on this phone call that we, were we are now uh, fully licensed by ACA to treat primary mental health illnesses. This is such a huge step in the right direction for futures. Um, we're so excited. As we all know, um, the staggering statistics from, from 2019, let's take COVID out of it and what COVID-19 has done to our society as a whole. You look at the stats in 2019 from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health by SAMHSA. Taking out substance use disorders statistics, it's, it's reported that one in five um, US adults are affected by mental illness. And only 40% of them are actually receiving treatment in some way, shape or form. Whether that's inpatient treatment with counseling, outpatient treatment with counseling, or some sort of prescription medication to help with emotions, nerves, uh, or other mental health illnesses. These are staggering numbers. That's over 50 million adults in our country. And that's only the statistics that we have. And over, lay over top of it, all the challenges that COVID-19 has been causing in our, in our country and in the world. We all see it. We all see it within our own families. We see it within our own friends. Um, I'm blessed that this is a family business and a family owned company. I'm one of five children. And with those five kids, my siblings, we have 17 grandchildren from my parents. So I know that mental illness is, is something that we all need to tackle as, as a community. And we need to come together to provide more beds, more services. So we are honored to be here as Futures Recovery Healthcare as just one little piece of the solution, one little piece. And we know that there's so many great providers on today. Uh, I wanna thank all of our professional referral sources that are out there that support Futures, that make future bet, Futures better on a day-by-day -day basis because they give us the real feedback, the real, um, the, the real things that we're doing great, but also the things that we need to get better at. For those of you who know me, uh, you've heard me say before, I know we're not perfect. By no means are we going to ever be perfect. But we will strive for perfection every single day. And we will take constructive criticism from our professional referral sources, because that's what matters. If we can take that feedback and not make a mistake twice, we are always going to be putting patient care and quality of care first. So where I love to say, Hey, if you haven't seen Futures, you got to see it. It's a beautiful building. It's, uh, it, it's really a five-star place. It, it's not about the building. It's not about the aesthetics. It's about the people inside of those walls that are helping our patients on a day-to-day -day basis. We have the best staff, and, and I'm so blessed that I could be here in Philadelphia while my team in Florida is helping every patient that walks through that door. And now, not only with a patient pre presenting with a primary substance use disorder who has an underlying mental illness, we could help people who have a primary mental health condition that need help. And we are happy to be able to say that Futures Recovery Healthcare is open to that. We've actually been treating patients for a couple months now in our mental health program. It's been uh, since November, but we thought it was very important to bring you all together here uh, already February 2021, to ask questions, to get to know our, uh, 
you know, our team, those people that are on the front lines of helping our patients day to day. So what well, I would love to go through and, and name every single person who's responsible for, for, for the quality of care that we provide. I don't want to get into 100 plus people and listing them all because they're all equally as important. Every single person inside that wall is equally as important. And they know that. And, you know, so today you're going to hear from some key individuals, right? You're going to hear from uh, Deja Gilbert, our director of operations. You're going to hear from Dr. Gloria Duncan, our medical director. You're going to hear from Angela Bustamani, our clinical director. But the list goes on and on and on. And each person that, that wears that future's badge wears it proudly and knows that compassion and quality of care for our patients is most important. So I want to thank you all. I want to just say one thing because I get to introduce the outreach professional team and the marketing team quickly. And then, uh, and then Laura will be last and she'll, she'll turn it over. But uh, let me first start by, by saying Stephen Watts, who, who unfortunately can't join us today. He had a, a prior engagement, but he, he uh, resides in Tennessee and works uh, the Tennessee market. Uh, Kim Coslow, if you could uh, just take a second, say hello and wave. And Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm Kim. It's nice to meet you. Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, I would like to introduce Cindy Goss up in New York. Cindy, are you, uh, are you able to just say hi real quick? Good morning, everybody. I'm happy to meet everybody and uh, look forward to the rest of this presentation. Johnny Egan uh, down in Florida. I want, to, uh, I want to welcome Johnny, who also covers parts of Pennsylvania, as that's where he's originally from. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. Brandon Hamdorf down in Florida. Please say hello, Brandon. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you guys for being here. Very excited to have you all. Dan Hoog, he is looking dapper. Look at him. They're all looking dapper, but where's Dan? Say hello, Dan, down in uh, North Carolina. Hey, everybody. So glad you could join us today. Thank you. I want to welcome Holly Gleason, who just joined. She's in Pennsylvania. Say hi to Holly Gleason. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And Jackie Scafidi, say hi, Jackie. She's, she's uh, so important to our marketing team and making all of our branding look so spectacular. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And then Victoria Hauser, who is our Associate Director of Marketing and Systems. Say hello, Victoria. Hello, thank you for coming today. And last but not least, Laura Koontz down in Florida. Uh, Laura, Laura and, and Johnny, I wanna, I wanna just say thank you both for taking the lead on putting this wonderful uh, uh, grand opening together. Sorry it is via Zoom, but this has become the norm for now. Um, so thank you all for the time. Uh, I'm always available for questions. Please reach out to any of your contacts. You'll get, get my number, get my email address. I'm happy to have a conversation anytime. But thank you all very much. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Laura Coons. Thanks, Mike. Um, hello, everybody. It is incredible to see so many familiar faces and names. A lot of Jackies. A lot of Jackies. I think we had a tech issue. <laughs> um, so a lot of you are named Jackie. Please excuse that. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Laura Coons, and I have been on the team here at Future since 2015. And that being said, I can't tell you how proud we are to educate you all more on this new program today. And that starts with a tour. So please join us for a video tour of the mental health program at Futures Recovery Healthcare, followed by some words from our chief operating officer of all of our programming at Futures, Dr. Deja Gilbert. Hi guys, it's Laura Coons, and I'm super excited to give you a tour today of the mental health program at Futures Recovery Healthcare.
more information on this program, feel free to reach out to myself, our 24-7 admissions line, or any member of the Futures family. Thank you for watching. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed the brief video today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Deja Gilbert, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at Futures Recovery Healthcare. And let me start just by saying how nice it is to see so many familiar faces joining us today. Thank you so much. And as you know, we can't do what we do without each one of you doing what you do. So thank you for taking the time today and joining us and learning a little bit more about our mental health program here at Futures. With that being said, as we mentioned, we opened in November of 2020, and we are now licensed to treat primary mental health disorders through our residential ACA licensure approval. This program was a unique and natural opportunity for Futures, considering the capabilities of our facility to accommodate the space on a completely separate program, the capabilities of our licensed and experienced team who are already successfully treating dual diagnosis on a daily basis, through our other programming, as well as our safety protocols and measures we were able to put into place in order to keep Futures a safe, calm, and healing atmosphere atmosphere for all of our patients. For those of you who are unfamiliar, our residential ACA license allows us to treat primary mental health disorders at a residential level of care. What this means is that we are not an acute option for you, but we do work very closely with our community partners who are able to treat an acute, an acute patient and also serve as a Baker Act facility, receiving facility. We can help guide you through this process and connect you with those facilities who would subsequently transfer them to our residential program if and when appropriate. So just reach out to our team if you're not sure, but just uh, so you all are aware, this is a subacute residential program here at Futures. We're gonna get into a little bit more detail when uh, Dr. Duncan and Angela speak about what is an appropriate or not an appropriate placement for this program, but I just wanted to kind of make that, that point clear. As I mentioned, and, and as you saw in the video, this is a completely separate program, but it's situated within our Futures facility. It's on the second floor. It has its own private community areas, therapy space, a separate and dedicated nursing station, and all clinical services are delivered within their own therapeutic environment. And so they only meet with individuals in that mental health program. Futures standard of private bedrooms and private bathrooms for every single patient under our care is also a part of the stay for all of our mental health patients. And finally, I would also like to briefly take an opportunity to share with you just a few of the newer additions to our team that are working with our mental health patients. Michael Burel uh, joined us as a psychiatric ARNP full time. So he is situated right on that unit and available not only to those patients, but our entire facility. Munigo Lopez, LCSW, joined our team as a primary therapist, as well as Natalie McLashen, who's an LMHC, and she joined our team as a primary therapist. They are both uh, specific to our mental health program patients. And then both Lakeisha Green and Regina Simonelli are providing case management services within that program as well. They've all been amazing additions to the Futures team. And I do encourage you to give our outreach team a call if you want additional information on any of the people servicing the program, any details on the program that we may or may not cover today. And without further ado, I will now turn it over to my colleague and our triple board certified medical director, Dr. Gloria Duncan. Dr. Duncan. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. Okay, good afternoon everyone and thank you for taking the time for being with, uh, to be with us on our exciting time opening. Um, we've been, like Mike and Deja said, we've been open, we, we've been actually offering services to our patients for a couple of months already and uh, it's very, uh, you know, we provide a very safe environment. I am very passionate about it. Uh, my team uh, works very well uh, together and uh, 
we try to uh, you know, make it very comfortable and safe for the patients. Um, the, uh, as you know, and Mike said, you know, that the uh, prevalence of mental uh, illness is increasing, especially with the pandemic, uh, especially anxiety, depression, um, the factors, you know, we all know, and, uh, you know is uh, uncertainty, isolation. Um, now our goal is to help the patients uh, reintegrate, go back to, you know, their outside world. Some of them are going to go back to work. Uh, some of them are going to go back to taking care of the families. Uh, it's, you know, it, in that. So we work with, uh, if we offer the psychopharmacology, it, it's an integrated service, psychopharmacology, which is my end. Uh, and, and then the uh, clinical individual group therapy. Uh, we're very, very uh, in communication all the time. Uh, as everybody, well, you know, most people know that, you know, one doesn't work without the other. Sometimes you, can do, you cannot do therapy sometimes if you are so depressed or so manic. Uh, that's where the medication aspect comes in. Uh, we offer uh, uh, pharmacogenomic testing, which is just a guide to uh, measure some, uh, you know, genetic pathways that will help determine whether a patient will respond better to certain psychotropic medications and others. Uh, it's not absolutely necessary, but it certainly helps, especially with patients who have been, have failed many trials of other uh, medications. Um, my team consists of, um, like they just said, a full-time nurse practitioner, Michael. Uh, he's board certified in, um, in psychiatry. Um, by the way, my Triple boarded is a board certified in addiction medicine, addiction, addiction psychiatry, because I, I did a special you know, fellowship on that, and uh, general psychiatry. So that's what it's, a lot of people ask me about that. But you know, and they are they all you know are pretty much you know intertwined. Um, the uh, patients uh, are on the second floor. They you know they they are uh, like I said, it's very very tight tight uh, community. Uh, they, uh, you know, have uh, 24 nursing uh, care. Uh, I'm available, you know, if I'm not here, by phone. Uh, and uh, they, you know, they go through the same process as all of our patients, history and physical, uh, medical issues are uh, attended to. Uh, we will, you know, we order some labs, uh, just have some basic labs. Uh, we order, uh, in, in mental health, like to have, uh, you know, some, uh, thyroid measures because, as you know, a lot of the uh, patients with depression have problems with thyroid. Uh, and, uh, you know, we try to, when they have, when there's medical records, I, you know, I like to review them because then uh, you have a better, you know, baseline of what your patient, you know, was fun how the patient was functioning, what the goal is. But in general, the goal is, you know, to reintegrate into society uh, and provide the best care possible in a safe environment. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'll introduce you to Angela Bustamante. She's our clinical director. Hi, Angela. good afternoon, everybody. My name is Angela Bustamante. I'm a licensed mental health counselor, and I am the clinical director here at Futures Recovery Healthcare. The mental health program is something that's very close to my heart because like many who are brought to this field, we've either been touched with substance use disorders or mental health or we know somebody around us that has been, like Mike mentioned. When I was younger, I experienced my own family members deal with the struggles of mental health. <clears throat> As a teenager, I didn't quite understand what was going on. I knew that my loved ones thought differently and they felt differently. And, and maybe even at times they looked a little different than me. And with that compassion, I had curiosity. And with that curiosity, I had compassion. And when I was in high school, I decided to um, explore taking psychology classes as a college education and college graduate. And when I got to college, I didn't change my major three times like some other people may have. I, uh, I knew right away that I wanted to go into psychology and I really wanted to work with people who struggled with mental health. Um, enough about me. Let's talk a little bit more about the clinical aspect of our program. So our program is really designed off of three major principles, um, and, and there's many more, but um, we really focus on community, connection, and safety. And community because we've all seen and heard the stigma associated with mental health illness and mental health conditions. 
people have been judged and outcasted because they may think differently or they may feel differently. Maybe their own family members don't quite understand what they're going through and know how to support them. Um, and we want them to have a community of support. We want our patients to have a sense of belonging. And so community is really important to our approach here. If you noticed during the virtual tour, we talk about that community programming. So the patients are with each other to validate, to support throughout the entire day and their entire duration while they're here with us. Connection, because we want our patients to start re-exploring their purpose and maybe even starting to explore what their purpose is in life. We want to empower our patients to find purpose and connection through self-exploration. We offer art therapy and music. We offer recreation therapy and mindfulness. And those are just a few things. We'll go into the schedule here in just a few minutes. And I can be super long-winded, so I'm going to just try to keep it all very succinct for everybody. But we want to empower our patients to find that purpose, to remove some of those barriers, to move from darkness into more passion and purpose for their life. We know that through the pandemic, um, like Mike had mentioned, and even prior to the pandemic, we've had a lot of patients come in to us that have struggled with more depression, anxiety, self-harm, and suicidal ideation. They've really experienced a disconnectedness to themselves and to others. And we want to pull them out of there, and we want to improve their emotional, social, physical, and mental well-being. And the final thing I wanted to touch on was safety. Um, safety is one of our, our biggest pillars here. All of our decision-making here starts with safety. Um, it's a big part of what we do. And it's, in, it's especially important for this population because they're in a new environment. They have a routine, a schedule. Um, there are medication changes going on. There's social engagement. Safety promotes trust. And so every patient, when they walk through our doors and they go through the intake process, they sign a safety contract. It allows us to start exploring what maybe some of their warning signs are and also to start identifying their coping skills right from the start. Um, so our goal is to provide an environment where they feel emotionally, mentally, socially, spiritually, and physically safe through our compassionate and non-judgmental stance. So I'm gonna go a little bit into um, some of the individual work like Deja Gilbert mentioned about um, our clinicians that work here on the unit. And so our patients uh, receive individual work and family work throughout the cor entire course that they're here with us. The first week, they're meeting with their primary therapist three times. Um, we really wanna engage the family process. So the first week that they're here with us, they receive two individual sessions and a family therapy session. Thereafter, they're meeting with their therapist at least twice a week. And let's be honest, some of our patients do require daily interventions, a check-in, um, intervention, you know, crisis stabilization. So some of our therapists are meeting with their patients a little bit more often, but for the most part, three sessions their first week and then two sessions thereafter. Um, and like I mentioned, Family therapy is incredibly important. So we wanna pull the family in. Um, we wanna make them a part of the, the, the process while they're here with us and also incorporate the family into the aftercare process too because some of our patients are going back to their moms and their dads or their husbands and wives and children. And so it's really important for us to incorporate the families into the clinical work that we do here. We'll switch along to group work. Um, and so our patients are in at least five clinical services a day, but that's not their entire schedule. Um, and I'm gonna kind of combine a little bit. So the patients are in um, structured scheduling starting first thing in the morning. We want them to get up. We want them to start working on their ADLs, take their medication, have a healthy and hearty breakfast. Um, the patients get to engage in a little activity in the morning. We believe in that motion, helping change emotion. And then they go into their daily programming. Um, they start with a community and connection group, like as I mentioned, that the patients are um, really a part of that community engagement throughout the entire course of their stay. And so they start with a daily group on bringing them together, exploring goals for the day, discussing um, stuck points and what they have on their agenda. And then they go into clinical programming. And like I mentioned, they receive five clinical services throughout the day. 
Um, our groups are really focused around dialectical behavior therapy, um, creating a safety plan, intentions, and building success. Uh, we discuss discharge planning with them. Um, and what we do is when the patients come in, they get assessed within their first three days. And we use a psychometric assessment. And our group curriculum is based off of that. And so our group curriculum and also the treatment plan all work together to show progress for the patient while they're here with us. A um, little bit more about the daily schedule. Uh, we incorporate every single day recreation into the schedule, which again, we think is super important. Um, they have an opportunity to uh, pick some of their recreational activities. And then sometimes we pick the recreational activities for them as well. We try to create uh, a nice blend of them going outside and experiencing what we call self-soothe, where they engage in all their five senses. Um, we allow them to do some work in our, uh, our recreation room. We have a pool like you guys have seen in the tour. Um, all an opportunity for them to get moving because they are in a pretty intensive clinical day here. Uh, four days out of the week, they do two hours of DBT. Um, and so we're not a DBT program, but we do believe for this population, focusing on emotional regulation, distress tolerance, and interpersonal effectiveness, and also mindfulness are, are a big core of what we do um, and help promote stability within the patients. And then at the end of the day, um, they have a wrap-up group. And that could be kind of just a structured circle up wrap-up group. It could be, hey, let's all work on a puzzle together. Let's go on a walk together and discuss our highs and the lows from the day. So again, bringing the community back um, all, all throughout the day and at the end of the day to process with one another to provide support and validation to one another. Um, and the final thing that I wanted to leave you guys on was some of you guys might be asking, what types of patients do we, do we have in our mental health program? And like mentioned, Mike mentioned, we've been open since November. Um, and so we've been seeing patients come in with mood disorders, uh, bipolar, major depressive disorders, um, anxiety, a, lo a lot of generalized anxiety, um, some thought disorders. Uh, and, and with that being said, and some of you guys may have questions around this in, you know, when we get to the question part, um, but for us, that medication management is really important. And so if we have patients that come in that are struggling with thought disorders, such as delusional disorder, we want to ensure that they're going to be compliant on their meds. Because again, our goal here in the residential treatment setting is to ensure stability and to have them work towards their treatment goals and their treatment plans. Um, and I think that's it for my end. And so without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Johnny, and he's going to facilitate a question and answer form for all of us here today. Hello, everyone. So we've come to the question and answer portion of the grand opening. Uh, we realize we're only as effective as our partnerships we form and use in and around the community of families, clinicians, facilities, doctors, uh, we also strive to continue to examine efficacy in the treatment of this vulnerable population. So due to the size of the attendees present today, I'm gonna ask whoever has a question to use the raise hand feature. Uh, there's a participant icon right next to the chat underneath the video uh, with the, where the people are. Um, this can be found at the bottom of the screen next to the chat icon. So I will call on you, unmute you, and then you can ask your question, and then I'll ask a specific member of the future staff to answer your question. And for the sake of time and to get to as many as possible, please limit yourself to the question being asked. Do we have any uh, questions from the population? Don't see any hands yet. Johnny, hi, it's Laura Coons. Um, hi, Laura. I would like to ask a question to start us off. Are we a Baker Act receiving facility? So I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Duncan answer that question. Um, a, a simple answer, we, do, we are not a Baker Act receiving facility. Uh, the Baker Act uh, is uh, when a patient uh, is deemed to be uh, uh, in danger, self or orders, or not being able to take care of themselves. 
uh, is for 72 hours, and those 72 hours on uh, you know uh, professional uh, goes on evaluation and decides whether they need more treatment or not. We are not that type of facility. Uh, many times when you have uh, vapor acts, uh, the patient is not being capable or have what they call have the capacity to do uh, full consent for treatment and uh, in, in mental health is absolutely necessary. Uh, in a vapor act treatment facility, they can uh, have the uh, judge come in and do a hearing and uh, they will ask doctor how long do you think you need for this patient and uh, you know I will say I think I'm going to need two weeks to work with this patient and at that point uh, you know the patient uh, has to be uh, compliant with whatever you know the doctor uh, and the team uh, recommends. Uh, we cannot do that. That's if this is a voluntary program. Uh, like I, like Deja said earlier it's not acute. It's so bad. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, next will be Dr. Laura Ellick. Hi, I just have a quick question um, because I know this comes up sometimes. How does Futures handle clients who come in possibly with co-occurring eating disorders? I'm going to have our clinical director, Angela Bustamante, answer that, please. Hey, Dr. Ellick, such a familiar face. Um, and so for us, you know, if it's a primary eating disorder, we are not, uh, we are not capable of treating primary eating disorders. And so I know a lot of you um, in our grand opening here might have some experience working for a facility. Um, we might refer to one of our, our partners for a primary eating disorder, but certainly for co-occurring, um, you know, it goes back to our medical team. Um, and so Dr. Duncan will meet with the patient, explore and assess to determine what's going on, looking at the weight, um, exploring their past history, and then determining if they're gonna, they're, then they're see our nutritionist. And if we do have that co-occurring and our nutritionist works collaboratively with our medical team and our clinical team, we determine what the course of treatment is going to look like them. Again, co-occurring, so we do wanna make sure that um, we're assessing and not treating the primary eating disorder because as most of us know, um, there's a little bit of a different structure and pace to treating primary eating disorders. Does that help answer your question? Thank you. Thanks, Ange. Uh, next, I'm going to go to Thurman Brown, but uh, if your name is Jackie Scafidi, could you possibly please change it? I believe there's 40 Jackie Scafidis. One of them has their hand raised. I just want to make sure I can answer the right person. So, uh, Thurman. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I was, uh, I'm just curious, uh, because you guys talked about family association, and I was wondering at what point in their, uh, in their treatment process, are they allowed to do like reintegration, you know, like go out with their family, you know, five, eight hours, or whatever the duration of your program is. I'm curious about that. I'm going to once again turn that to Angela for that for the answer for that. Angela? Sure. That's a great question, Thurman. Um, because our patients are here for different lengths of stay, and our goal is really to promote and provide stability for them, we are a residential program. And so our patients do not leave the facility. Uh, they are, again, safety is a number one goal here. So we are constantly supervising, keeping our, our eye on the patients. And so if we allow them to leave, um, they wouldn't necessarily meet that residential criteria for us, and we'd be cautious about the safety. So we do have our patients remain on grounds with us. Um, we invite our family members to be a part of family therapy, like I mentioned, whether that's over the phone or as we're doing right now via Zoom. Um, but we do not have our patients go off ground as part of that reintegration. We may have patients go to a lower level of care and discharge planning for us is incredibly important, again, to involve the family members in. The, the patient and the family may not be ready for the patient to go right home. So we may recommend a lower level of care, such as a partial hospitalization program. So they have that ability to step down and integrate into the community and that might be reintegration with their family or integrate into a new community where they're learning basic living skills and they still have that ability to receive services for their mental health conditions as well. 
Thanks, Ange. And somebody uh, asked a question in the chat. I'm going to have Dr. Gilbert answer this. It says, what is our average length of stay? Thank you, Johnny. I, I noticed that one pop up in the chat. So our average length of stay is actually determined based on the patient's needs and based on the treatment plan. Obviously, if they're coming in through insurance and they're dependent on utilizing that insurance, we would do reviews with the insurance company to make sure that they're meeting eligibility for residential level of care. But in general, we have a lot of individuals who come in and they have within a couple of days, they've established their treatment goals. And so once those treatment goals have been um, come to fruition and they are making progress and we assess them as needing a lower level of care, that's actually when they complete. And so it's not necessarily one week, two weeks, six weeks or eight weeks. It's really dependent on every single patient and what their needs are, what their goals are and how quickly they're moving towards their goals and how quickly they're progressing. Next, I'm gonna have Susan Dean. Hi everyone, um, thanks John. My question is about um, what can someone who has a full-time job expect when considering the program and how is that handled during their residential stay? Angela, do you wanna answer that? Absolutely. Um, because our program is very intensive and the patients are here for the psychiatric stability along with medical and clinical, our goal is to have them engaged throughout the entire process, so involved in all their programming. Um, however, we know a lot of our patients come in that do have full-time jobs. And so uh, within the first few days, our patients meet with our case managers. They assess what's going on prior to them coming into treatment. They assess their current needs and they start to make a plan for their discharge needs as well. Some of those current needs are, I have short-term disability or I can apply for FMLA so I can really focus on what I need to take away the work barrier and the stressors. Let me focus and dive into getting stable and working on coping skills and working towards our treatment plan goals. So our case managers help with FMLA and short-term disability. Um, EAPs, if there's any conversation, communication, uh, that happens a lot as well. So we want our patients to return back to their responsibilities once they leave here. Um, however, they make that decision and choice to come here at that moment because they need to, to break away from some of those other stressors and focus on getting stable. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, Lisa Corman writes, do we have a college age program? Also, can we accommodate for rel religious or dietary restrictions? I'm actually gonna turn it over to my colleague, Laura Coons, to answer that. Thanks, Johnny. Um, in terms of the religious or dietary restrictions, we absolutely can accommodate. We have a, um, a full culinary team on site, a private chef. He can accommodate most dietary restrictions. We do see a lot of um, you know, gluten-free, um, dairy-free, um, gastric bypass, so we can do portion control. In terms of kosher, so we are not a kosher kitchen, but we do have a kosher microwave, and we work with a great kosher kitchen who will freeze the meals, bring them to futures, and then we utilize the kosher microwave. All right, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna go to the Jackie Scafidi with her hand raised. I'm gonna ask to unmute you, so if you can answer your question. All right, maybe it's a myth. Susan Sigsby, you're up. Hi, um, just a question on, do you offer a Suboxone program? And if you do not, do you allow for the patients to come in and do a taper? Dr. Duncan, can you answer that, please? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Now, we do uh, not have a Suboxone maintenance program. We do allow patients to come in on Suboxone, but uh, it depends on the goal. Uh, usually that does not happen in mental health because uh, in mental health, Suboxone will override the effect of the psychotropic medications. Uh, so it's not, you know, 
Uh, if they're psychotic, we, I have to take them off the suboxone. If they're very, very depressed, I have to take them off the suboxone. But in the poor program, yes, we do. Uh, and they must remain on suboxone. Uh, what we do is like uh, help them come up other substances and then help them uh, transfer to a program that will uh, keep them suboxone in place. Thank you, Dr. Duncan. Uh, Todd wrote, how about finishing high school if they're 18 and in the last semester? Um, Angela, I know our case managers could answer that as well, but do you want to answer that? Yeah, so um, I think that's a really great question. It, I think it would really depend on their needs. Um, you know, we want our patients to engage in the process throughout the entire day, which again includes the five clinical services. Um, and so, and also be a part of the community as well. So it, it might be a little difficult in that regards, but our goal is really, again, for the patient to participate in their, their needs in the moment and, and be, be in the community as well. If you have any other questions, please raise your hand. There are some questions that have come up since we first opened that I will uh, propose out just because uh, sometimes maybe they're, you're, you're wondering what the answer would be, but the cost of the program, I will turn that over to our colleague, Kim Kozlo. What is the cost of the program and do we accept insurance? Thank you. Let me unmute. Um, what is the cost of the program? It, uh, private pay is twenty nine five, and do we accept insurance? We do. We're out of network, but we do accept insurance. Thank you, Kim. Also, what comes up often is sometimes when we're dealing with mental health, there's a crisis on hand. Uh, so I'm going to ask Dan Hogue this question that comes up often. What are the times of admission for the mental health program? So because of the, the need for a good thorough assessment, we typically admit Monday through Friday. I believe the hours are 9 until 4 p.m. Um, that being said, that you know, if, there's, if there's a need, if there's something that you need us to work with, we'll take it on a case-by-case -case basis, take everything in we can into consideration, do our best to, uh, to accommodate you. Another question that came up on a recent tour, and I'll ask it again to Dr. Duncan because I went to her for the answer. Dr. Duncan, what are your thoughts on the use of Thorazine or Halperidol as medication for our mental health program? Okay. Uh, actually, um, I don't believe in polypharmacy and I don't believe in sedating patients. Uh, I would I like them to stay on the lowest dose and the least number of medications where they can function. Uh, and my goal is not to numb the patient, but to actually reintegrate them to, uh, you know, being able to function. If it, like, like we said earlier, if they're a student, they're going to be able to, I, I'm not going to use medications that are going to impair their, their memory. I, I, I'll try to stay away from it. Um, Taurusine uh, is what the first antipsychotic uh, ever. It, it's still a good one, but we really only use it for emergency. Uh, if somebody is truly psychotic and agitated and, uh, you know, you, you, you weigh the potential resources for benefit. But as for, uh, for maintenance and for your, when they go home, I want them to go home medications that they are going to be able to continue taking and not interfere with their ability to function. Thank that you. Has been the answer, I understood. Yeah. Uh, same thing with Halgo. You know, same thing is, is, is the same. I have had to use Halgo a couple of times in my unit already, which uh, very cautiously, and uh, it, uh, it does the trick. It, you know, sets the patient in the right track, then we can switch to a milder medication. Thank you. The infamous Sarah Sanders, you have a question? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me, John Egan, and your team. Um, my question would be, high acuity mental health psychosis, how do you handle from a Baker Act to your facility when they have been quote unquote stabilized through um, haloperidol, risperidone or Thorazine and then that wears off. Um, what would be your mode for say a 
bipolar with psychotic features that experiences, you know, really high acuity delusions and psychosis. Do you, as a team, believe in long lasting injectables? Um, and how do you go about doing those Treat. and treating and treating them with long lasting injectables? That's my big question. Thank you. Dr. Duncan, do you want to speak on her question about long lasting injectables? Yeah, let me let me uh, see paraphrase it. Uh, you said uh, they are Baker acted, they're stabilized in the Baker acting facility, and then they're on, uh, you know, of course, in Halgo or any of the typical antipsychotics. Um, and you're right, it will wear off. Do we do long lasting injectables? Yes, we can do it. Uh, and then, if, uh, if obviously, for aftercare plan, it is, it is really important that they have an appointment to follow up. Because most long-lasting injections, uh, uh, you know, and psychotics are, are for four weeks, uh, except for con uh, consta, which is every two weeks. Uh, but yes, and you use those mostly when people, when people are non-compliant. They don't like to take medication. So it's not something we're going to encounter very often in this setting. But if necessary, yes. As a matter of fact, right now I have a patient that I am thinking of doing that. Uh, before she discharges, it has to be with their consent. Yeah, but we Very good. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from Carolyn Lewis. I'm going to have Dr. Gilbert answer this. How are we dealing with admissions through COVID-19? Most out-of-state travelers must quarantine for 14 days. Yeah, so there's two different actual components. One is how are we dealing with them as far as admitting, and then how are we dealing with them as far as returning home? The easy one is the returning home. There's several states out there right now who are requiring that a COVID test be administered within 72 or 48 hours of returning to their home state. And so that is something that we are able to accommodate here through our medical team. And we are able to draw that test and get those results so that when they travel, they can travel home with a clear test. On the other side, the incoming. So prior to admission, we do a pre-screen verbal over the phone just to identify whether there's high risk for exposure, you know, kind of what I think everyone is in general used to going through the gamut of typical questions. They then arrive at our facility and we actually do a pre-screen outside. So before they enter the building, we do a swab on them and we get an instant result prior to entering the building. Once they enter the building, if they, even if they have a negative on the swab, but they are presenting um, as a positive high risk, we will put them immediately in isolation. And we have protocols in place to maintain the safety of our staff so that while there, uh, there's different types of testing, as I'm sure you all know, but while those results get rerun a second time with the laboratory, they'll remain in isolation. It's typically no longer than 24 hours. We have a relatively quick turnaround right now. Um, and while they're in isolation, our nursing team can go in and work with them with proper PPEs and gear, uh, and they are able to attend therapeutic sessions. We have computers set up for them during that isolation period, so they're not alone and all meals are brought to them. So once they're cleared and they're here in our facility, there's no one else in the facility from a patient perspective that hasn't gone through that same process. So they are asked to wear masks throughout the day when they're outside of their rooms and all of our staff are masked uh, and screened every day and throughout the building. Does that answer that one? We're pretty diligent. We've been very blessed here so far uh, through this pandemic and, and I know a lot of People have struggled both, both personally and with work. And, um, I can say we've been very blessed here so far. Thank you. Rick Parrish. Thank you. I noticed that was part of my question. There are also some good questions on the chat screen. What if the client turns out to be positive? Then what? Dr. Good Gilbert, question. would you like to? Yes, so actually I'm going to defer to Dr. Duncan because she has dealt with this case, I believe it was once. Um, so I'm going to defer to Dr. Duncan on what our typical protocols are as we look to her for all medical guidance. Okay, uh, well, we have had, we've been lucky. 
Uh, I think we had one case and uh, actually the patient remained with us for a couple of weeks and we were very cautious, even, even housekeeping with full PPE. Um, the patient um, did a uh, detox uh, and then was receiving uh, services via Zoom, uh, medical services, uh, but uh, it's the only one case. Why? Because we could not, it was out of state and we couldn't send the patient back if, if it's responsible. We, uh, we, they can't, you know, to send them, put them on a plane to recover. But uh, that's, luckily we don't have that very often. Yeah. The, the reason I ask is we've run into that several times that some treatment centers, if we're flying a client to them, they want them tested before they get on the plane. Some want them tested when they get to that city, but not at the facility. It's all over the map. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually jump back in there. Look, the complications of COVID right now are y you can test before you get on the plane and you get it when you get on the plane. Um, so what we do is our perspective is we do due diligence. We take best precautions um, and we really just focus on what is best for that patient. So if someone does come and they test positive, but they're in medical need and they need detox, we're gonna put them in isolation because it's, as Dr. Duncan said, it's irresponsible to, to say, you know, here you are, you're presenting with symptoms that could potentially be life-threatening, um, but you have COVID. So we are fully equipped with full gear um, from head to toe, gowns, you name it, uh, to be able to handle that person and make sure that they are not exposed to anyone else. Uh, staff or patients in the building. And then upon completion of medical safety, so once Dr. Duncan and her team have deemed them to be medically stable, we have, during that instance, what we did is we gave them the option of remaining in isolation until they were no longer, you know, according to the guidelines, no longer um, potentially exposing other people but it, their services would have to be still uh, administered via Zoom or we could transfer them or discharge them, but it was would not be considered an AMA. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the, the general gist of what we've done, but no, if someone arrives and they're here and they are seeking care and they are in medical crisis or medical need, we are not saying, hey, hop back on a plane. That's, that's just not something we would do. I'm sorry, just to add to that, I, we have even actually have a couple of designated rooms, what we call isolation rooms. They have their own little balcony patio because if they're smokers, I mean, we're not, you know, we try to make it as comfortable as possible. We don't want them to feel like prisoners. So they can, you know, go out as long as they don't come in contact with, you know. And, and Rick, just to add one, one last piece to that, and we won't belabor this one, but... Uh, it is important to, to note too, just the, the general layout of the facility is very conducive to um, you know, safe, our safety protocols with respect to, to COVID-19. Um, all, all, every bed in our facility, regardless of what program you're in, is, is a single occupied bedroom. So uh, we don't have any shared bedrooms. So that, uh, obviously we're taking the precautions with respect to um, quarantining and, and isolating them in certain rooms, uh, but we also have, don't have mixed populations at all. So that kind of helps with the you know, potential spread of, of such pandemic. The next question is uh, for Angela. How do we handle clients on a conservatorship or guardians? I'm actually going to ask Dr. Duncan to help me out with this question. Uh, we had a patient in the past who... Um, was under guardianship. We are a voluntary program, obviously, um, but we do have some patients that come in that their families are involved. So, Dr. Duncan, do you want to help jump in? Because I know a lot of this has to do with the medical care. Yeah. And yeah. go ahead. Sorry. I, 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 you know, I dealt with this a lot in the hospital, so I'm very familiar. Uh, all they have to do is present me with the papers, the legal papers that they are the legitimate guardians, uh, and then uh, because for medical care. They, it has to be voluntary, but once they have a, a guardian, um, we have to take uh, the guardian into consideration in all the decision making, uh, including medication. So if I want to change the medication, I have to talk to the guardian and educate the guardian and present it 
with like if I was talking to my patient, this was the side effect, this the you know the benefits, etc. So that's how we handle it. Yeah. Okay. And Todd Weatherly has a good uh, question. I, um, I'm Todd. You want to ask it yourself? Yeah, sure, why not? Um, thanks, John, I appreciate it. Good to see some familiar faces. Uh, just transitional, when you got somebody that's finishing residential, what are you guys doing for transitional living? Are you partnering with other folks? Have you got houses that you're using on your own these days, or how are you managing that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Angela, would you like to speak on uh, the aftercare plan and how it begins uh, at Futures? Absolutely. Um, like I mentioned before, you know, the, the discharge planning, the case management needs um, are important, especially in the beginning stages. Um, like Deja mentioned, you know, we don't have an average length of stay. So we're constantly assessing stability psychiatrically, clinically. And at the same time, we really need to also create an aftercare plan that involves not only the patient, but the family member as well. So when they're ready, clear, and stable, and they've met their treatment goals, they're ready to transition. Like I mentioned, some of our patients go to partial hospitalization. They go to a PHP program that may offer housing. Some of you guys in our grand opening might be working for those facilities, and outreach could kind of jump into to that a little bit more. Um, some of our patients are going back to work. Uh, some of them have their own families, and so we may explore an IOP program for them or a therapist, psychiatrist. Uh, nutritionist, like Dr. Ellick was asking before, if there's some co-occurring eating issues. So all of those considerations come into place throughout their entire time that they're here with us. And every patient leaves with a discharge plan with set appointments. And our discharge plan not only has those set appointments, but it also has important phone numbers on there in case they need to refer back to suicide risk hotline. Um, we have NAMI information on our discharge plan. So the discharge planning is a really important piece that doesn't happen that last week of treatment. It starts in that first few days while they're here with us. And just to add one additional thought, as many of you know, primary mental health treatment availability is um, something that is hard to come by in the quality of care and the needs to base patients, not just residential, but for that aftercare, that key component, as you're asking about specifically. And so our outreach team is responsible, you know, not only for having strong relationships in the communities that they work in, but for meeting potential um, facilities or programs or even private therapists and private practice because we don't put on a discharge plan any recommendations unless they've been thoroughly vetted by futures and that we feel confident that they're going to a good aftercare program again whether it's a facility or a private practice or a psychiatrist I can tell you that in almost every single circumstance, we have not only spoken to who they're being sent to, but we have been on property, we've been in the office. And so our outreach team is constantly, we actually started about six months before we opened this program, tasking them with finding aftercare throughout the region and throughout you know, our typical uh, country areas that a lot, most of our patients are coming from. Um, so any resources, again, I'm a big proponent of sharing resources amongst good facilities and good practitioners. So please do so. Um, anyone on here, please make sure you send recommendations over to our team and they will make sure that they meet with you or who you recommend. All right, we're going to squeeze one last question in. I've heard, I see a couple sorry, questions about add, our. I'm sorry, can I add something? Just tag along with the as far as psychiatric because it's mental health. Ideally, I like to have the person who's going to follow up, continue your care, uh, have the patient sign uh, for release information so they can have the records already waiting for them. That is tremendous help for, for a doctor, for a psychiatrist. So that's all. Thanks. That's okay. Our last question, uh, a couple months ago, we launched our Heroes Ascent First Responder Program. And obviously, a lot of veterans and first responders suffer from mental health without substance use disorder. Angela, how do we treat our first responders in our mental health program? So we have a clinician that is a vet herself. 
and she will work with the patients on an individual basis. Um, we don't have a specific track right now for the Heroes of Sentinel Mental Health. However, we hope down the road we'll get to that point. Uh, but Kate Polk is our therapist, um, and she works in both programs. And then again, our groups that we offer, our structure that we offer, groups on DBT, emotional regulation, distress tolerance, also the, the groups on interpersonal effectiveness, where we know sometimes family dynamics um, are really impacted with a hero. Um, the, the structure of the group and the curriculum that we offer will also be effective for what we call them heroes to come into our mental health program. Thanks, Ange. Mm -hmm. Well, the time has come to wrap up our grand opening. Uh, we at Futures want to thank you all for attending. We also want to recognize your commitment to these patients. Um, you know, all of us working hard to be a part of the nationwide solution for our mental health. A member of the outreach team will reach out to you in the next coming weeks to discuss further who you are and how you treat to work in a collaborative effort to treat mental health most effectively. Lastly, we know this is a virtual platform and can, it can only illustrate so much. So if anyone here has never been or would like a personal tour of the facility to see futures firsthand, just to feel the aura and the atmosphere of wellness, please reach out to one of uh, the outreach members here. God bless you all and thank you all for attending. Thank you.